So here we have then the European-American relationship. When you look back at that relationship since the Second World War and identify the elements of that relationship, you will find that it is practically exclusively 80% two things, security, NATO of course, and economic cooperation, trade, investments, research cooperation across the Atlantic. All this very good, very essential, very important, no doubt that. But I would say that 80% of the agenda between Europe and the United States has been related to what we can do for each other across the Atlantic. Fine. It started with the Marshall Program, which was a wonderful program after the Second World War, uh, which was done in complete contrast to what was done after the First World War, which, by the way, what we just may agree, was bad for the reasons why we were came into such a negative development leading up to the Second World War. But the Marshall, the Marshall Program was a wonderful way of bringing Europe and US together on the economic, uh, in the economic area. And then, of course, NATO came with the security side. But if you ask yourself, is this in today, today's world, today's world, the right agenda or the correct mix of the issues in the European American I've been thinking a lot about that, and I've come to the good conclusion that the answer is no. We should definitely build that relationship on these two aspects. They are pillars, no doubt. But how about in the day and age of globalization, US and Europe also adopting a global transatlantic agenda? Why shouldn't we, who represent the richest part of the world, have a global agenda dealing with the global issues that not, not only are pressing for solutions, but in fact affect our own security. In my view, we should do it both out of the right thing to do perspective and, I would say, the enlightened self-interest. I looked at the figures, by the way, it's interesting to see what an enormous economic force we represent. In 2006, I don't have later figures, the European Union and the U.S. combined economies accounted for nearly 60% of the global GMP. 60% of the global GMP is us. 33% of world trade in goods. 42% of world trade in services. The EU and the U.S. are each other's main trading partners. Trade flows across the Atlantic amount to around 1.7 billion euros every day. 1.2 billion dollars every day. How about that? With that economic strength, with your political strength, not least now under President Obama, with the acceptance of his and the United States position in the world, and Europe's combined resources, and hopefully soft power in terms of societies where you have economic strength relatively well distributed, social cohesion inside societies, although we have strong pressures from migration inside Europe, it's a problem in itself. Uh, we have the awareness of the environmental balance. We have the awareness of the importance of knowledge and science and people who believe in the future. All these things that are the best parts of what we desire to build with the European Union. If we then combine on a global transatlantic agenda. What could that then uh, contain? I would, of course, mention first the so called global threats, or global issues. The most obvious one is, of course, the environmental degradation, the uh, climate issue, where the Copenhagen negotiations now do in November, December, and December, and where I think it's extremely important that the new direction that we see uh, coming from the United States is translated very soon to concrete practical commitments. And where Europe, I think, is ready to go along, and where I think we could really take the lead in those negotiations. Uh, related to that is, of course, the whole issue of uh, poverty, poverty reduction. I've been coming back only last year, last summer, from Darfur, 
uh, what I've seen there is something that I would never forget. Uh, Somalia was the equivalent in the early 90s, but it was horrible. And when you see the children uh, in the villages out there, because life is actually better in the villages than it is in the camps, with gray skin instead of black skin and dead eyes. And when you hear women screaming at you and you hear what they say is water, you realize that they have to go two hours to get clean water. And if they don't get that clean water, they come back with dirty water. And then the children die out of dehydration, and I've seen it myself. Then you ask yourself, how about putting that on our agenda? If we can have we can have seven hundred billion dollars in a in a package to the stimulus of our own economy. How about using one hundred billion dollars, which is what it costs to bring clean water to every human being on this earth? This clean glass of clean water is a luxury for one point two billion people. Another 2.5 billion people don't have sanitation, toilets. This is the main reason for the spread of diseases uh, in, uh, in Africa. 300 million people in the south, south of Sahara don't have clean water. The main reason for, one of the main, clearly, possibly one of the main reasons for, for child mortality and, and, uh, and uh, women's mortality. This could be a great humanitarian, great project, wouldn't it, for the U.S. European cooperation. What a message that would come out. But identifying one such concrete issue, put that on the program, do something for people around the world who are really crying out for these, these measures, and at the same time, do add an ethical dimension to our own cooperation, and bring back the, the, what we want democratic countries to be seen as in the developing world. Another program could be girls' education. I've been out there again in Africa and I found and saw that, and I know that twice as many boys get uh, primary education as uh, related to girls. A woman, a girl, who learns to read and write, in 98% of cases, teaches her own children to read and write. I'm sorry to tell you men and boys around here that we are doing it only to the extent of 45 to 50 percent. But a woman who learns to read and write more or less automatically transmits that to the next generation. So with a birth rate of 3.8 children, the point eight is not on an individual basis, <laughs> you have a, almost a four time multiplication of literacy in one generation. What an investment. And not only that, they also are better at avoiding the AIDS and diseases. Once you educate, you have a reduction in, 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 uh, in uh, contracting AIDS. So it's a tremendous uh, effect on that, apart from the fact that you hand over the uh, chance to read and write for the next generation. You could also choose uh, organized crime for the U.S. European agenda. This is one of the most serious dangers to the international world today, to the international corporation today. The power of organized crime, the syndicates, the money that is around here on, based on crime and illegal activities is staggering. You have about $300 billion uh, in, nar in narcotics, in the drug trade. You have $150 billion approximately in illegal arms trade. You have $100 billion in prostitution. 1.2 million women and girls and boys, young boys, are sold for sexual purposes around the world. We have slave trade. All this can you imagine that money, which reaches astronomical uh, proportions? Where, where is that money? Well, it's not black ties and yellow. Sorry, black ties and yellow ties. Black shirts and yellow ties and shaded glasses. It's very much white shirts. It's very much very 
respectable countries and very respectable islands in the English Channel and the Caribbean and, and the sweet European continent in mountainous areas. And that money goes into our system. This money is not taxed. <coughs> the public sector, however, is taxed. You are taxed. And what the countries of the Horn of Africa or Eastern Europe or Asia can offer in terms of salary to a customs officer or a police officer is very little because you have to cut down the public spend. While this other giant is growing, the 800 pound gorilla is in the room. And I've seen, and I'm seeing that danger when I traveled in, the, in Africa, Asia, and even in Europe, that this is undermining society. You have Italian prosecutors being afraid of their lives. Some of them have been blown to pieces. The man who leads the world, UN World Fighting Crime, Antonio Costa, who's a great friend of mine, and a wonderful person, was a prosecutor. He was under threat. I was in the Balkans and I heard about good judges, justice ministry people who really took the crime fighting seriously, and they were threatened. Their families were threatened. So this we really have to deal with. How about using that, putting that on our agenda? The last one I could continue, but I want to love but the research on tropical diseases. There is not much research going on, I think, but I want to be proven wrong, on TBC and malaria and the worms that kill children when they, when they go in the river in uh, the places I have been. It's not a very high priority. We have other priorities. Diabetes and obesity, obesity and so forth. But how about dealing with the diseases that are out there that are killing people by the millions? So this, I think, I'm, I'm going to give these as examples. I want to be very concrete because I think to talk about Millennium Development Goals or even 1% of the GMP, fine. But it's abstract. This is abstract. You need to talk about girls' education, water, crime. Put a practical agenda and then have a program to deal with it. And we, who represent the democracies, many Western democracies who have this prosperity, these resources, in spite of our present difficulty, we should take the lead on that. And what a great ethical drive, what a great, how meaningful this would be for us. We haven't seen that, neither strongly from Europe nor from the United States in the last few years. So here's, this is sort of the message that I'd like to convey. That's why I suggested that or this theme, because I wanted so much to say this. It's been such a fantastic experience to be here the last two weeks as I have at the United States Institute of Peace and the Atlantic Council and with you here to present this case and see my friends from my Thailand's ambassador who are now friends who are sitting in the White House and waiting to be confirmed <laughs> the State Department Treasury. And to have a chance to, to give this message and I hope that we in Europe also will be prepared to do so. Uh, in this case, I want to be self, in this regard, I want to be self-critical. Uh, we have a long way to go in Europe. We are 27 now in the European Union. We were 15 when I was ambassador here and president of the European Union. Uh, we have not yet adopted the constitution, the Irish referendum. Uh, we voted no, as you may know. Uh, we may have, they may have another try at it. We'll see what, if the answer is yes. Uh, we have big difficulties with getting Turkey, uh, the Turkey negotiations going. Uh, we and the British, I think Sweden and UK are the strongest forces to put, put that forward, the issue forward. It's important that Turkey is in, that we develop a relationship to a secular Islamic country with, uh, with an enormous potential to influence uh, both the Middle East situation and developments in Asia. Uh, and also a country that has 5 million of their own people inside the European Union countries. If Turkey would not be allowed to enter the European Union, we would say to the Turks who live in Europe that you are second class citizens. So this is why that issue is important. So we have a long way to go ourselves. But I want to challenge my own European friends also when I get back. And I now belong to the faithful opposition. Sometimes democracy doesn't work, so I'm not foreign minister. So <laughs> so we are more open. But anyway, uh, this was the, the agenda on what I would say this 
But I would suggest and push for very strongly the global dimension of the transatlantic agenda. My last remark, remarks would be on the, what Michael and Sandra also mentioned, that I would also like to point at a few conflict areas where Europe and US could work together. And some of them are, of course, obvious. Um, one of them is, of course, Afghanistan where you have to develop, uh, we have to develop a policy that is not only based on the peacekeeping or military uh, presence, you also have to have a program for fighting uh, the drug trade. 90% of the opium of the world comes from Afghanistan, uh, at least in Europe, 90% in Europe. Uh, we have to have a program for civil society, we have to have a program for fighting corruption, we have to have, of course, a policy for Pakistan. Uh, it's a very, and great need for a holistic, Michael knows this better than most, a very a great need for holistic, comprehensive approach. Uh, and, uh, and that the outside presence is seen as a positive. We have a great risk now that the outside presence is seen as a problem, and in the end, possibly an enemy. In that case, we are all in trouble. Look what happened to the British and the Russians when they were there. We have Hope to God that by a more holistic approach, uh, we we uh, do, uh, we avoid that situation. We have also Iran, and here I think President Obama has courageously and, and very well made the point that diplomatic relations or opening to diplomatic contacts in no way means rewards. There was a belief during the early administration that you know, having a contact would mean uh, approval. Diplomatic relations is a channel of communication. Even Rabin said about the contact with the Palestinians. We have to talk to the Palestinians because you don't talk to your friends. To, to get out of a conflict, you don't need to talk to your friends. You need to talk, talk to your enemies. And therefore, it's very important that we open up for dialogue and contact. And here I think the, even if I think the Iranian reaction was unnecessarily negative, they could have been more subtle in my view, in their reaction, but I think this is not the end of the story. There is the beginning of a contact which is now taking place, very important, and I saw in the press today, which many of you probably also saw, that the US is now joining the talks uh, on Iran together with the European Union and China and Russia. That is a very important step. So uh, Iran is another area. Of course, I would wish that we could also work together in Israel-Palestine. But that is, of course, perhaps the most intractable of all conflicts. And here I think uh, I would submit that the US steps, US policies will be decisive when it comes to the outside of things. To solve the issue, there has to be uh, the right type of developments inside Israel and among the Palestinians, and there the signs are not very positive in today's situation. And I think the only outside actor that really could make a difference is still the United States. The United States position is in Israel is, of course, extremely strong. And I also know from my Arab friends that they also realize that it is the United States that could be the decisive actor. I wish I could say that the European Union would be equally important, or that the United Nations would be equally important, but in that case, I would delude myself. And lastly, uh, of course, Africa. There is a lot of knowledge about Africa. Unfortunately, we very much rooted in colonial experiences from the British and the French. By the way, the border between Chad and Sudan in, uh, is drawn up in, uh, in uh, Europe, in Germany, in Berlin, 1885. If you look at the map when you go back home, if you don't have it in your head, it's drawn with a ruler, in fact, a German ruler, in 1885. <laughs> And with no consideration to tribes or ethnic background, or even valleys or mountains uh, that are not naturally how we draw borders. And then uh, the conflict that I'm dealing with, I can go further into that, uh, is almost impossible to solve unless you have normal relations between Chad and Sudan, because the Zagawa tribe, which is the most militant one, has equal number of Zagawas in the Darfur side as they have in Chad. And they feel a strong loyalty as Agawas, as to, they have to perhaps in some cases to Sudan and Chad. 
So there's a lot of knowledge in Europe, good and bad reasons, uh, that can be, can be used. And I think we, we could work together, not least on the enormous tragedy of Congo, uh, which has been an unseen disaster. Four or five million people killed in five, six years. And where I think it's time that we really take a, a more, more, more forceful uh, approach to solving that problem. I think I could uh, leave at that. I, I still just want to sort of end on a more positive note, since this uh, is slightly depressing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and that is that, first of all, I think I've been trying to say that we have an agenda to develop between US and Europe, and that we should, as Europeans, and we perhaps, if you think these ideas are good, try to send this message. And this is the type of uh, policies we would like to see, and that would then make an enormous difference. If, for instance, we could do something about this glass of water would be not a luxury, but a common good. Uh, and then, of course, you yourself, we are. We also, all human beings in today's world, I, I often felt for a couple of years ago that there was a sort of hopelessness about what can be done. And I remember my own relatives back in Sweden turning off the television when they saw the most horrible pictures and I can't stop it and it's too big, I, can't, I don't know what I can do about it. And I turned off the television, stop the world, I want to get off. And I, I would say that nobody can do everything but everybody can do something. And this goes for both the international scene and the actors in the international scene and each and every one of us. United Nations needs to be reformed. I'm the first one to say that. We can bring up that subject if you like a bit later. Uh, the uh, Bretton Woods system needs to be brought into the political uh, arena. Bretton Woods and UN and Europe belong together. World Bank and IMF. The European Union and the regional organizations uh, can be more active. The United Nations UN Charter speaks about regional arrangements. I think I have the, no, I have, yes, it is. I have the UN Charter here. <laughs> I took out my passport first. <laughs> but this charter has chapter eight, which talks about regional arrangements. In fact, the world body wanted first the regional actors to solve the problems and then we forgot that. So you have a union after union. Oh yes, all the other organizations are here. It's a UN obligation to work on regional level. And then governments, of course. And the uh, private sector. I talked earlier about the responsibility on human rights, on the environment, on labor legislation, and the enormous economic strength that is there, the technical possibilities, the research. It, Inside the, the pharmaceutical companies doing more on malaria. I mean, all this is also a responsibility in that sector. If that ethical dimension is added to what we do. And then, of course, the non governmental organizations. Each of you, you can all support Red Cross or Amnesty or Human Rights Watch, whatever you feel for. And then, at the end, it's you and me. So, I think we have to get out of that hopelessness that is there and realize that we have work to do. And let's use this financial crisis to bring new energy and think in a new way about it. And use what I often say, an attitude which is a combination of passion and compassion. You need to have passion, otherwise nothing happens in life. On any level, I was about to say. But we also need to have compassion. Without passion, nothing happens, but without compassion, the wrong things happen. So let's add both the element of passion and compassion even to such a subject as the transatlantic relationship. Thank you very much.